Welcome back to Organic Chemistry 2, Radicals and Polymerization. Today uh, we'll finally come to a radical polymerization processes, industrially of superb importance, um, and we'll be looking at some other radical reactions. Let's jump straight in. Radicals can be very useful in the uh, selective reduction, reduction of alkynes to E-alkenes. Yeah? Um, this is a process which proceeds by a single electron transfer um, from uh, yeah, group 1 metals, for example, from sodium or lithium, as we've seen uh, in, on previous slides. Um, as I said, um, the product results selectively in an E alkene, yeah? so with both these substituents trans um, to another. Uh, contrast that with heterogeneous um, catalysis. Yeah? So here, for example, a um, Lindler catalyst. So it means we've got 5-8% palladium metal, calcium carbonate, palladium acetate, and all of that, and quinoline. And um, as you have your palladium particles, yeah, so a palladium surface, you have a dissociation of hydrogen gas on this palladium cell surface, um, and then a selective uh, reduction of your alkyne to a Z alkene, yeah, with both of these R group cis to one another as they fold away from the uh, palladium surface. Okay, um, now let's have a look at um, the radical uh, reduction of alkynes to E alkenes. So here, as we said, we have um, a single electron, for example, from sodium metal, which then, um, let, let us draw in the fish hook arrows again, which then cleaves this alkyne triple bond. And generates this radical anion here on the run, uh, right hand side. Yeah? And here the conformation of our um, rest groups is trans to one another yeah? in order to optimize charge separation of this uh, free radical and the anion. Yeah? Now in a follow-up step, this is now an ionic reaction, so we're using our curly arrows again. Uh, this negative charge can pick up a hydrogen from the uh, solvent, yeah, third butyl alcohol here in this case. Yeah, so these are, this is again ionic arrows. And we generate here our trans um, sigma radical. Now this is of course very reactive, so it will snatch up another electron fairly easily. Yeah, so we generate again our negative charge here, and we can do the same trick again picking up another hydrogen, yeah, another proton that is from the solvent. Yeah? And like this we get to our um, to our product here on the right hand side, yeah, an E alkene. Yeah? This is a very useful process in particular in the um, in the uh, synthesis of uh, the sex pheromone of a European corn borer moth. Yeah? So that is the uh, um, chemical formula of a sex pheromone. And indeed, the geometry of this double bond here in the center, yeah, cis or trans, depends uh, on the moth rays. Yeah? So now we know we have two ways how to make uh, an E alkene or a Z alkene selectively. So again, we can start out with our alkyne here, yeah, um, convert, uh, essentially deprotonate and convert it with, our, with an ethyl rest here, 
So this is our ethyl group which ends up here on the on the end of our molecule. So it means our sodium amide here. Yeah, let me just get the laser pointer here. So our sodium amide acts as a base, yeah, deprotonating our um, our alkyne. Um, in the next step, we're essentially um, again deprotonating the other end and attaching um, attaching here, yeah. So uh, instead of the ethyl group, we're attaching here our uh, CH210 OTHP group. Now the THP end group, yeah acts as a protecting group um, of an alcohol, yeah, as a THP ether. So here in this explainer box here in the top left hand corner, you essentially see if you'd like to protect um, a primary alcohol, you can uh, react it with dihydropyran, yeah, DHP, to this tetrahydropyranyl uh, ether. Yeah, so you have here your ether linkage and this is essentially abbreviated as OTHP for short. We just draw it in here. So that would be the equivalent of R O T H B. Yeah, so this is exactly the kind of end functionality which you have here. So think of that as a protected alcohol and we will come back to this uh, to the concept of protecting group in the synthesis part of the course yeah you can deprotect this alcohol yeah so um, hydrolyze uh, this uh, thb ether using h3o plus here on the bottom left hand corner yeah so you regain your oh functionality here and now you have essentially two options yeah if you would like to generate the, um, uh, the E alkane, um, sorry, uh, the Z alkane here at the top, yeah, you would uh, react uh, your alkyne alcohol here uh, with hydrogen gas and the Lindlar catalyst, as described here on the left hand side, to get your to get your Z alkene, yeah, uh, and then essentially reacting the alcohol with uh, um, uh, acetic anhydride and pyridine would give you your cis pheromone. Yeah? Alternatively, um, you can go the route of single electron transfer from sodium um, and generate your uh, E alkane, uh, alkene here. Yeah? And again, with uh, acetic anhydride and pyridine, you would then get your Transferomone, yeah. So you can address um, all kinds of well, two ra two races of this European corn boner moth. An interesting application, yeah, of a single electron transfer process um, is the Birch reduction. Yeah, so the Birch reduction um, is useful for converting arenes um, to cyclohexadienes. So here we see. Um, uh, yeah, benzene, yeah, which is uh, of course an arene, yeah, very symmetrical one, and we will be converting um, this arene with sodium in ammonia again, and all of that in an alcohol as a solvent, yeah, and as as a result, as I said. Um, we will obtain a cyclohexadiene. Yeah? So in effect, we obtain two isolated double bonds separated by, the, by these sp3 hybridized reduced carbons here. Yeah? So we have picked up one hydrogen each at both of these ends. Yeah, so the um, uh, the reaction mechanism here is again fairly straightforward. So uh, the solution of uh, sodium metal in ammonia provides our electrons, yeah, which have been picked up here by the aromatic ring. 
and now this radical here is fully delocalized as we know yeah but again we're trying to achieve uh, maximum uh, to optimize uh, charge separation yeah in this newly formed radical anion yeah this is now followed by an ionic process yes yeah, so we're using curly arrows so this radical anion can now protonate be protonated yeah snatch up a proton from the alcohol to form um, our cyclohexadienyl radical here. Yeah. Now we get a second electron transfer to this radical. Yeah, and we form uh, here was a cyclohexadienyl uh, carbonyl. Yeah, I'm not going to write this out. It's a bit of a mouthful, but this can again um, snatch up a proton from solvent. Yeah, again using curly arrows and in the last step yeah we get our uh, unconjugated cyclohexadienyl product yeah so now of course um, in the case of uh, of benzene yeah um, there is absolutely no distinct uh, no distinction where in this uh, ring the first um, the first protonation takes takes place. However, for um, substituted arenes, this will matter quite a bit. Yeah, so we can have two types of substituents in our arenes. Yeah, we can have either electron withdrawing groups. Yeah, like for example here our carboxylate ester, uh, or we can have electron donating groups. Yeah, abbreviated here as EDGs. Yeah, for example, methoxy or hydroxy groups, um, and then um, this Birch reduction will go um, in a slightly different way. Yeah, so for electron uh, withdrawing groups, uh, the double bond of a product will try to avoid substituents. Yeah, and uh, for electron donating groups, yeah, the product has a maximum number of substituents on the double bond. In analogous fashion, yeah, again using single electron transfer, um, we can reduce unsaturated ketones. Yeah, so let's have a look at an example here using lithium metal this time. Um, so again, the lithium provides an electron, which then cleaves this carbon-oxygen bond here. And we are effectively delocalizing this resulting radical yeah, along this alpha beta unsaturated ketone. Yeah? Now in the second step, we can pick up another electron. Yeah, this radical can pick up another electron from the metal. And we generate um, essentially uh, an enolate anion if you think about this yeah now this anion analogous to the birch reduction can pick up a proton from the solvent and we have here yeah a trapped enolate if you like Now, yeah, because essentially this is still uh, this, this bond between oxygen and lithium is mostly ionic in character, as you remember. And now, um, 
uh, we can essentially pick up proton from the solvent or we can protonate um, uh, this compound and we essentially get um, an overall reduction of our alpha beta unsaturated ketone to a ketone yeah and we can of course um, as well uh, do chemistry on this trapped enolate yeah so this you see at the bottom here yeah so here we have uh, a methyl group in this alpha beta unsaturated ketone and the moment that we generate our trapped enolate here in this step yeah we can now react this um, with for example methyl, uh, me, uh, um, methyl iodide here yeah and get uh, a disubstituted ketone out in the last step radical processes are of particular interest in um, biosynthesis yeah so here we see um, the hydro uh, hydrooxylation of an alkane yeah um, to give us uh, this molecule here, yeah, which is cortisol, yeah, steroid hormone, and um, responsible uh, species, the radical species which uh, performs this hydrooxylation, um, is an iron oxo complex, usually a, um, an enzyme, yeah. Um, so here you have essentially your iron four attached to uh, sulfur and the rest of the enzyme surrounded by four nitrogen coordination sites. Yeah, usually this is um, a type of porphyrin ring. Yeah, um, and uh, the important part of this, uh, so this active um, part of the enzyme, um, can now interact via this oxygen radical species with our um, alkane here. Yeah, so here we have our CH uh, bond on an sp3 hybridized carbon, um, and again analogous to all of the mechanisms we've seen previously. Yeah, our radical from our, our iron oxo complex yeah, can subtract this uh, um, uh, this hydrogen here. Yeah, we generate our OH here and a carbon centered radical. And now we can cleave this iron oxygen bond. form a new carbon-oxygen bond and we effectively reduce iron to iron free and obtain our hydroxylated product. Now one of the most uh, um, important commercial applications of radical chem chemistry is radical polymerization. Yeah? We will look at this um, in a bit more detail in the fabrication of polyethylene from ethylene gas. Yeah? So polyethylene um, amounts to a total annual production of more than 100 million tons. Yeah? Um, and this is uh, one third of a total plastic market. You can see here at the bottom left hand side um, various bottles made out of polyethylene or high density polyethyl uh, 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 polyethylene. Um, and uh, uh, so that means polyethylene is essentially really used throughout. Um, the way how we make uh, polyethylene is a, uh, contains again all these three steps which we have learned about um, in uh, uh, radical chain. Uh, reactions. So that means we're starting out with an initi initiation process. Uh, we proceed via propagation and chain growth, and we also encounter termination events. So let's have a look at this process in a little bit more detail here. Um, we're again starting with, an, with a radical initiator. Yeah. So here are peroxide. which we can cleave firmly yeah, to give us our benzyl radicals here. Um, and now these radicals can react with our ethylene, yeah, generating um, 
a, a carbon-centered radical end, uh, which can initiate the chain growth. Yeah? So now we can um, use this carbon-centered radical to react with another ethylene. Yeah? And like so, we are generating a, a radical at the end of this chain. And if we repeat this process yeah, n times, with n ethylene molecules, we will essentially expand this chain ever further. Yeah. Now, uh, if these uh, ends encounter each other, yeah, we can we can get these termination events, which then form a new carbon-carbon bond, but do not generate an, uh, another radical, which can propagate this chain growth. Yeah. Now, um, ethylene is, uh, of course, not unique when it comes to its ability to form polymers. So here on the bottom right-hand side, you see a couple of other uh, commercially used monomers, yeah, like vinylidene uh, dichloride or vinyl chloride. Yeah, and these two are used to produce polyvinyl chloride, or um, as you might know it from plates of uh, insulating plastics, yeah, PVC. Now, if you think about um, uh, polyethylene chains yeah, or PVC chains, uh, these are effectively one-dimensional polymer chains. Yeah? So they're, they're grown in one direction, yeah? and uh, the forces which you might find between these chains um, are pretty much yeah, weak, dispersive, van der Waals interactions. Yeah? So, um, uh, given that these uh, chains don't uh, um, yeah, intertwine or uh, are of a particularly large weight, uh, you could prob probably quite easily uh, dissolve or melt down such one-dimensional chains. Yeah? So they can, be, um, they can easily move with, one, with respect to one another and then you of course lose a little bit of, uh, of strength. Now, uh, you might want to introduce strength into such polymers yeah, by cross-linking them somehow. Yeah? So introducing links uh, between these chains. Yeah? So this would effectively prevent that they can slide with respect to one another. Now there are several ways how to do this. Yeah? And let's have a, a brief look at two of them. Yeah? So uh, you could design your reaction in such a way um, that you introduce a cross-linker straight away as you start growing your polymer. Yeah? One of these examples is given here with this app initio cross-linking of polymers. Yeah? So you are introducing um, uh, um, a small amount of cross-linker into your initial uh, so, um, reactive solution. Yeah? So here, for example, we have styrene and one for divinyl benzene. Yeah? And when you kick off a reaction with your radical initiator, you will essentially grow your polystyrene. Yeah? But every now and again, you will also incorporate your one for divinyl benzene into this polymer chain. Yeah? Now, as you can see, this, um, this one for divinyl benzene has uh, um, two uh, yeah, vinyl functionalities in both these ends. So you can imagine that you can start, um, start growing another polymer chain on this end as well, yeah, as seen over leaf here. Um, now, uh, now these two one-dimensional chains of polystyrene are held together not just by mere some you know dispersive interactions and van der Waals interactions, but by real covalent bonds. Yeah, so you cannot you cannot translate them with respect to one another just by by using heat. Yeah, or, or uh, uh, yeah some sort of torsion. Yeah. Um, alternatively, when you're already stuck with one-dimensional polymers, you could attempt a cross-linking of a preformed one-dimensional polymers. Yeah, and this process. Uh, or one of the most uh, commonly used uh, process for uh, um, cross-linking of preformed polymers is the vulcanization of rubber. Yeah? So vulcanization of uh, vulcanized rubber contains uh, many E-alkenes, yeah? and unvulcanized rubber is all Z-alkenes. Yeah? That means effectively that during the vulcanization pro uh, process, 
we have an abstraction of these allylic hydrogens yeah and uh, most commonly or historically used for vulcanization uh, was sulfur yeah so you you start out with your sulfur rings um, and you can initiate uh, uh, you can form your radical initiator either by some sulfur radical or indeed by um, your uh, di radical oxygen molecule yeah so let's draw that in using our sulfur radical we would essentially form a radical on one of these ends of our um, of our sulfur chain yeah so this uh, sulfur sulfur bond is relatively weak yeah so it means uh, these disulfides uh, cleave relatively easily yeah so the um, delta G for a sulfur sulfur bond is well around about 140 kilojoule per mole yeah so we we can we can generate these sulfur radicals fairly easily um, now essentially we this this uh, active end can form an S5 unit and we generate yeah, a slightly slightly shorter chain sulfide radical. Yeah, and there are many um, possibilities how these sulfur rings can react with sulfur radicals. Right now, this um, sulfur radical, yeah, which we've generated here, can now indeed abstract an allylic hydrogen from our unvulcanized rubber. Let's draw that in. Yeah, and again we're left with a with a radical which will probably seek out the most stable position in the rubber chain yeah like so as a tertiary radical yeah and this tertiary radical now can uh, in turn react with other sulfur rings yeah sulfur 8 or sulfur 5 rings And effectively generate reactive ends, yeah, which in turn can react with other parts of the chain or with neighboring chains, yeah. And as such, we are generating crosslinks, yeah, between rubber chains with, yeah, with mostly E alkenes. Um, and as such, yeah, again. Crosslinking has the uh, effect of strengthening uh, um, the rubber, yeah, as you are introducing covalent bonds into in between your one-dimensional polymers uh, polymer chains. So here on this slide, you see uh, some other well-known polymers, yeah, polymer names or their commercial names. Just to um, give you an overview, this, this list is by no means exhaustive and. Uh, you shouldn't you shouldn't really learn it by heart, but just just to give you an overview, um, as we discussed, polyethylene, yeah, its monomer is ethylene, and uh, we're using it in packaging and plastic bottles, um, polypropylene in all kinds of moldings or carpets, uh, PVC, yeah, in particular not only in insulation but also in vinyl records, polystyrene you would have seen in all kinds of packaging foams, Teflon on your uh, uh, non-sticky coatings uh, on pans and pots, also on gaskets, and um, a couple of other um, uh, polymers obtained from acrylonitrile, methyl methacrylate, and vinyl acetate. So we've seen um, in the previous lectures how to radically halogenate yeah, alkanes and alkenes. And now we can also look at a radical dehalogenation process using tributyl tin hydride. Yeah, so tributyl um, the hemolysis of tributyl tin hydride is promoted uh, by AIBN initiator 
You will remember AIBN from um, a couple of lectures ago. So this is our AIBN with uh, central nitrogen nitrogen bond. Yeah, so this molecule is set up to generate two stable radic uh, carbon centered radicals when heated and to kick out nitrogen gas. Yeah, it's a diatomic molecule. So this would give us our two carbon centered radicals yeah, and nitrogen gas. Right, now these two carbon centered radicals can now be used to generate our tributyl tin radical yeah, by simple abstraction of this hydrogen. And uh, the tributyl tin hydride radical, which we've just generated, can now go on to react as described previously, yeah, initiating the radical chain reaction. Yeah? So we can extract our halogen here. Generating, uh, generating a carbon-centered um, uh, radical here on the right-hand side. Yeah? And this carbon-centered radical now snatch up a hydrogen from tributyl tin hydride. Yeah, regenerating our tributyl tin radical. Yeah, which can then you know go on and dehalogenate further starting material. Now this uh, entire process, yeah. Is, um, uh, oh, is energetically favorable, yeah, uh, because we're forming fairly strong new bonds, yeah, so we're forming um, a tin bromide bond, yeah, in this process, and we're forming a carbon hydrogen bond, yeah, with 400 kilojoule per mole. Apologies for that, that was my alarm. Everyone's awake now, I hope. And we're breaking a tin hydrogen bond and a carbon halogen bond. Yeah, so overall energetically favorable. Yeah, if we look at the uh, Gibbs free energies of the bonds which are being broken and formed. Um, and ultimately, uh, yeah, we get our product here, a dehalogenated organic molecule. Um, just like all the reactions we've seen previously, um, our carbon-centered radical, if, uh, radicals, if they find each other, they will terminate the reaction. The same applies if two um, tributyl tin radicals find each other and form a relatively stable tin-tin bond. Finally, as a bit of an outlook on year three material and materials later in the course, let's have a look at radical cyclization. Yeah? Um, uh, we're going to start out with this molecule here with a primary radical adjacent to a double bond. Now we have two options um, how this radical can cyclize. Yeah? So for one, you might imagine that we're forming here five-membered ring, yeah, and our exo product or alternatively, yeah, you could imagine that we are reacting through this terminal carbon and forming our endo product.
Now in the endo case, we're forming a secondary radical. Yeah. We know this is, this is more stable. In the exo case, we form a primary radical. Yeah, so less stable. Now you might think uh, that the formation of the endo product is a preferred one here. However, what we see from reaction kinetics, yeah, is that the um, exo product is formed with yeah, 2.3 times 10 to the power of 5 second and the rate constant for the formation of the endo product is roughly two orders of magnitude lower. Yeah, so irrespective of the stability of a final product, uh, we see here further evidence that it is indeed bond strength yeah, and kinetics um, that are generally more important yeah, in uh, radical cyclization uh, than the stability of the resulting radical product. This brings us to the end of Organic Chemistry 2 Radicals and Polymerizations. Um, I hope that you gained uh, a bit of an insight into radical chemistry and some of the important, in particular, biological but also industrially relevant applications that radical chemistry finds a way into. Um, I will see you again uh, in the course part on synthesis and how we bring uh, all the functional groups and molecules together to make new things. Until next time.